Ja, dat is ja. dus Ik kan een beetje. Oké, oké. Okay, okay. Hello everyone, welcome to the uh, Eindhoven Innovation Cafe. Uh, it's nice to see you all here with so many. Uh, for those who haven't been here before, the Eindhoven Innovation Cafe is a weekly networking event where we show what Eindhoven and surrounding places have on offer in the fields of tech, design and knowledge. Uh, today we have Willem Mulder here to um, tell us more about engineering the future of health. Um, and uh, so we're here every week, so do check out our uh, program on our website, ehvinnovationcafe.org, for the most uh, up-to-date uh, program. Uh, feel free to have a drink at the bar afterwards, uh, and you're also welcome to have dinner at the meet-up table um, that we organize in, uh, in accordance with this uh, event. Anyway, enjoy the presentation, and I'll leave it up to Dawn. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, let me see if this works. Ah, it works. So something about my background. Um, I've actually uh, spent almost 15 years in the US from 2006 all the way to the end of uh, 2020. Um, because of pandemic and, and, and changes in the world, I, I decided to move my research activities and my entrepreneurial activities to the Netherlands. And I think there's a tremendous untapped opportunity in this region of the world that I don't think we're properly exploiting. So at the moment, I'm a professor at the Radboud University Medical Center. I'm a professor at the Eindhoven University of Technology. I also serve as a chief scientific officer of strain therapeutics discovery. And today, I'm mainly going to talk about Biotrip. And that's the, the opportunity that I think that we should take advantage of. So I'm here actually to discuss with you the convergence between medicine, engineering, and entrepreneurship. Um, I'm actually a graduate uh, from the Eindhoven University of Technology, and what I've noticed is that the, let's say the, the, the space between engineering and medicine, although there's a department of biomedical engineering, that it's, it's too large. Um, so that's why I decided when moving back to the Netherlands that I was going to open two labs that work as one research group. And so one at the Eindhoven University of Technology, um, and one at the Radboud University Medical Center, so we can actually develop technology, evaluate it preclinically, and try to make the step all the way to the clinic. Um, so what we've also seen in, in terms of convergence is a convergence of two scientific fields, or two fields of engineering, that have actually been deemed unsuccessful for a very long time. So one of the fields is my field, that's nanomedicine, that's the application of nanotechnology in medicine. The other field is the field of immunotherapy. And up until, um, let's say, the successes that were introduced in the, uh, in the beginning of this century, that field was almost deemed a pseudoscience. Um, and now um, these are essentially the biggest therapeutic modalities that are out there. Everyone knows about nanomedicine now. A lot of you will be, have been vaccinated with these lipid nanoparticles that contain mRNA. That is a result of the efforts in the field of nanomedicine. And a vaccine is a type of immunopharmaceutical. So we've seen that convergence. Um, I'm a biomedical engineer with a background in chemistry, and I work with a prolific physician called Mihai Nitea. So he's one of the most renowned infectious diseases specialists in the world. He published over 1,200 papers. Um, I always call him a wizard uh, because you know, he looks at all these new concepts in immunology. Um, and we started collaborating back in 2016 when I was still in the United States. It was one of the reasons that I actually um, was looking forward to coming back to the Netherlands to more in, um, intensely collaborate with Mihai. Um, I'm going to talk about nanomedicine. But let, let me first talk about immunotherapy. That's the specialty of Mihai. So Mihai is a physician, but he does a lot of research, uh, clinical trials, clinical research. And we're in the era of immunotherapy. So at the beginning of this century, checkpoint inhibition therapy was introduced and became clinically successful. That is a new type of treatment for cancer. That's an immunotherapy, um, and it's really making a difference. Immunotherapy sounds very revolutionary, but it's actually really ancient. Um, so immunotherapy was actually trialed at the end of the 19th century. It was introduced by a doctor called Dr. William Coley. He was the chief 
uh, uh, chief surgeon at New York Hospital, is now Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and he discovered that if you introduce live microbes, micro uh, bacteria, into, into patients, into cancer patients, he actually observed tumor remission in the subsets of these patients. This is a very dangerous technology because you have to inject or administer to patients live uh, bacteria. Um, so that fell out of fashion. But that was one of the first therapeutic modalities for cancer. So then at the beginning of the, um, of the 20th century, um, radiotherapy, chemo chemotherapy uh, were introduced, and then this type of therapy fell out of fashion. But that's the first example of immunotherapy. Um, now, now we're in, in the 21st century. Um, Mia Nete has been working in the field of immunotherapy and, uh, and immunology for, uh, for more than 20 years. And he actually discovered why this works. And it's a concept that we refer to as innate immune memory. Um, maybe, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but our immune system is comprised of two arms. One is the innate arm, which is evolutionarily speaking ancient, and then we also have the adaptive arm of our immune system, and that harbors an immune, <coughs> a, 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 a immune memory. And so, for example, these vaccines, you try to induce what's called antigen-specific immunity. What Mihai Nitea discovered is that that ancient part of our immune system, so the innate arm of our immune system, also harbors a very primitive immune system, uh, or immune memory. Um, and they discovered that in medical students that were BCG vaccinated. The BCG vaccine is actually a vaccine that was developed over 100 years ago against tuberculosis. It's a live microbe, so it's a, it's a, bacteria, a bacterium that is intradermally administered. Um, and um, in these medical students, they discovered that, that these students become more resistant, or at least the immune cells of these students become more resistant against all kinds of different infections, not only against tuberculosis. And that was a weird phenomenon. And so they started researching this phenomenon and discovered that in our primitive innate immune uh, system, the harbors a very primitive memory. And that memory opens up, at least for biomedical engineers, a lot of opportunities for immunotherapy that have been untapped thus far. So how does this work? I'm not gonna go into details, a little bit complicated, but a lot of these immune cells that are part of the innate immune system, they have a lifespan of maybe two to five days. As you may have heard of these inflammatory cells, it's called monocytes, and they circulate in the blood. They disappear in about two to five days. This immune memory, innate immune memory, which is referred to as trained immunity, can be observed for a much longer time. And so that is a little unusual. So what's going on here? And so what me and his team discovered, and you know, we've collaborated on this, is that it becomes a property of the progenitor cells, that are essentially the, the parents of immune cells, in the bone marrow. So in our bone marrow is where our immune system originates, and there are cells called stem cells and progenitor cells that give rise to all your leukocytes, to all your white blood cells. Um, and so this trained immunity, this innate immune memory, is located in the bone marrow. And so that is a very nice opportunity because we can reach potentially the bone marrow. And then if we can reach the bone marrow, we can tap into these progenitor cells, as so the parents of our immune cells, and then try to regulate immunity at the level of the bone marrow. Um, so we fantasized about that. And it would be an awesome opportunity that, uh, as I mentioned, is, has, been, has not been exploited yet. And so the idea here is that we're not gonna target a disease. We're not gonna go after a cancer. We're not going to um, uh, go after an, in, an inflammatory lesion. Um, we're going to go after that bone marrow, try to reprogram it, and then let the immune system do its job, uh, what is an, uh, its natural job. And this can have applications in all kinds of diseases, autoimmune disorders, cardiovascular diseases, um, or in organ transplantation. Um, that are actually disorders that are... Um, uh, characterized by, let's say, an excess of immunity, but also in situations where there's immunosuppression, like we see in, in cancer or an in infection. Okay, so we started working on this concept. So the bone marrow is our target. Um, we applied that in the space of immuno-oncology, so for the treatment of cancer. We applied it in transplantation, in cardiovascular disease. I'll just show here the application in in cancer. Uh, um, 
I'll keep it a little bit simple, uh, but I want to credit these two people. There are two medical doctors. There were PhD students in my group. Uh, this is Mandy van Leen. She actually inherited my lab uh, at Mount Sinai in New York. Bram Prim um, also returned to the Netherlands, is now working with us in one of the labs and in the company. Um, and so what we've done, as you remember, there was this BCG vaccine. And that vaccine, which is a live microbe, it's, a, it's, it's bacterial, uh, bacterial based. Um, and we thought, like, maybe we can make a nanomimetic of that BCG vaccine, uh, because that very nicely um, induces trained immunity. So what we essentially did is we developed a platform that we actually we've been working on for the past 15 years. We refer to as nanobiologic technology. These are essentially lipid nanoparticles, very similar to the lipid nanoparticles that, um, you know, that were used for the development of these vaccines. With one big difference, these things are composed exclusively of natural building blocks. So there's no synth synthetic components in these nanomaterials integrated. This is actually stuff that's floating around in our body. And so these, these, let's say, nanostructures, they transport fatty molecules throughout our body, so they float in the blood. Uh, you may have heard of good and bad cholesterol. Well, this essentially is based on these type of transport systems in our body. We engineer them in the lab, but they're very well tolerated because they don't contain synthetic materials. And we can create these libraries, we can make them spherical, we can make them discoidal. They contain this blue protein, and that protein allows us to very specifically go after the cells of the innate immune system and after these progenitor cells that harbor in the bone marrow. So this is very nice technology. It's benign, it doesn't do anything, uh, especially not at therapeutically relevant doses. But then we're gonna turn it into an immunotherapeutic drug. Um, so we made a little animation. So this is Mandy. This is a bacterium. Uh, MIHI's team identified what molecular structure in this bacterium actually induces this strained immunity, this innate immune memory, and we templated that on top of these nanobiologics. And so what we now have is a nano-sized microbe. Yeah? It's safe to administer intravenously, and it will go after the bone marrow. And so this is stuff you can't inject into a human because that will induce sepsis, and that's how people die. Um, okay, so... Why then do we want to induce this trained immunity, this innate immune memory, in the context of cancer? Well, it's because many cancers actually hijack innate immunity, so the ancient part of our immune system, to protect itself against the patient. Um, and this is actually an evolutionary concept that we see in embryonic development. And so an embryo is, is not um, native to the mother, uh, so it's a foreign species. And so embryo, embryos protect themselves against the immune system of the mother by hijacking a part of the immune system, the innate arm, and protect themselves against what is called these, these lymphocytes. Well, this also happens in cancer. And so you have an immunosuppressive ring of innate immune cells that actually um, prevent T cells, which are other cells of the immune system, from attacking the tumor. So here we have a problem. And so one arm of our immune system is actively working with the tumor against the other arm of the immune system. <coughs> okay, so what we do then is we develop these nanobiologics, and so these mimetics of this BCG vaccine that can very efficiently, when you in, uh, administer them intravenously, can very um, efficiently accumulate in the bone marrow. We here see this in a mouse. Um, and what happens next is that we see that that immunosuppressive rim of the tumor microenvironment is outcompeted by a more pro or anti-tumoral pro-inflammatory uh, rim of innate immune cells. And so we change this tumor microenvironment from immunosuppressive to a tumor microenvironment that actually is fighting against the tumor. And then you also have these other cells, the other white blood cells are, that are called lymphocytes, then they also get access to the tumor. So we get, let's say, two-pronged approach we change the tumor microenvironment, and we allow these T lymphocytes to attack the tumor as well. Now, the current immunotherapy that you may have heard about, it's called checkpoint blockade therapy, is a therapy that activates these T cells. It's been very successfully uh, applied. There's actually you know, one of the people who's done lots of clinical trials in the space of immunotherapy is actually in the audience, um, and it's one of, the, one of the biggest revolutions in medicine. But it does only work for about 20 to 25% of the patients, maximally. And one of these problems is 
this immunosuppression. So with our technology, we can overcome that immunosuppression. And what you then see is that normally with this, this is in a mouse model that is refractory to immunotherapy, what you would normally see is that this is tumor growth as a function of time. You see that these are control animals in black, and then here in yellow, you see animals that were treated with immunotherapy. It does not work at all. So, but if you first induce trained immunity using our technology, you can see that we can induce tumor remission in a mouse model that's extremely aggressive. Um, that is this lower graph here. Um, and, um, and it's very special uh, because this is a very aggressive uh, mouse melanoma model. Okay, so this is nice. You know, we're not in the business of treating mice, uh, ultimately. Um, and so we want to go to the clinic. So what we've done, and now we're still in the United States, we, um, we founded a company called Train Therapeutics Discovery. And, you know, this, this is projection. I, I like windsurfing. It's not me, by the way. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, and so we're now at the stage with this company that uh, we're scheduled to go in the clinic, so to dose the first cancer patients somewhere in the second half of 2023. Um, obviously, it's all confidential information, so I won't go into detail. But this is a structure where we develop technology, we preclinically evaluate it, and then through entrepreneurship, we get it to the clinic that I think we can also do in the Netherlands, particularly in this region of the country. So. Over the course of 2021, we've been working really hard to establish a new research group. And so I returned to the Netherlands at the beginning of, of 2021. Um, yeah, and then we have a very nice new research group that spans the Radboud University Medical Center and the Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, very important to the success of this research group and how we establish this is its leadership. So we have Roy van der Meel, who's an assistant professor, Evelina Kluza, who's been working with me for over 10 years. Thijs Belman is a former PhD student, and then Johanna Toner, she was my lab manager in the, in the United States, and I call her my secret weapon. She's a tiny woman, but she's amazing. Um, so with this group of people, we have a Eindhoven team and a team uh, in Nijmegen, and then we work on two programs. One program is that, that RNA technology that we can now put in the muscle, we want to go after the, the bone marrow. And so we've been working on this, and we have very nice technology, and this is the group of PhD students, <coughs> students, and leadership working on these new technologies. What we're also working on is creating new protein. There's a lot of proteins in our body that we can actually re-engineer for immunomodulation, and we do that with this team. And it's so really nicely integrated. That's what we have people, um, engineers, um, uh, people, uh, uh, physicians, uh, biomedical scientists, working in Eindhoven, working in Radboud, you know, visiting the different sites. And so we have a very nicely integrated team. Okay, so with this team, we're gonna develop these new technologies, but then we want to take it to the next level. We wanna ultimately get it into the patient, and that's why we um, founded BioTrip. So what is BioTrip? Um, well, I think BioTrip is a unique opportunity. This is not fluff. We have now seven patents as a result of our research activities that are now owned by BioTrip. And with BioTrip, we're going to try and develop new biotech companies like we've done in the past. So why do I think that there's an untapped opportunity here? Um, this is a relatively new highway. It's called the A50. It originates in Eindhoven and then goes north. Um, and so if we zoom in on the area between Eindhoven and Nijmegen, let's do that. Then obviously here in the south, we have the Eindhoven University of Technology. This is the Helix building. Um, Helix building is you know, one of the best infrastructures in the world to develop new technologies, to develop new nanotechnologies, to develop, develop new proteins, new drugs. Um, but what I've noticed is it always stays confined to this building. And maybe you test something on a cell, but it doesn't leave the building, essentially. Write a nice paper about the technology. Um, but there's activities in the space of nanomedicine, of protein engineering, of immunotherapy, small molecule drug development, RNA nanotech. Um, so this is, a, this is one of the best places in the world to develop these technologies, but then we have to take it um, and evaluate it and develop it into a real drug. So if you look at the history of the Eindhoven University of Technology, 
then this was actually established in 1956 of, let's say, this, the, you know, with the help of this Marsa help after the Second World War. Um, and was, the main reason was because there were companies like Philips and Duff, the automobile manufacturer, um, and the need for engineers. What we need now, and that's also why we're here, is that there's a need for entrepreneurs in this <coughs> region. And so it's really a, a good area for entrepreneurship, but not yet for biotech entrepreneurship. And, and we hope we can, you know, we can propel that. Okay, then we continue the journey on the A50. And then halfway between Eindhoven and Nijmegen, there's this town called Os, which is known for the, for the Socialist Party, but it's also known for the Pivot Park. Um, and the Pivot Park was founded in 2012. It's, it's a European uh, drug development location. Um, and it's built on the artifacts of a, um, a pharmaceutical company called Organon, uh, that a lot of you will know. Uh, so, but the Organon infrastructure is now the Pivot Park, and so there's a lot of companies that actually help you with drug development. It's, um, so it has a very rich history. Um, Organon was founded in, in 1923. Um, it was actually founded by uh, Saul van Zwanenberg, who worked at a slaughterhouse. Um, and uh, there was a professor from the University of Amsterdam. In 1921, it was discovered that insulin could be extracted from the pancreas of animals, and that could be used as a treatment for uh, diabetes. So in 1923, Organon was founded. What Organon is also known for is uh, contraception, and it was introduced in 1963. Um, but what a lot of people don't know, and I was speaking about that immunotherapy revolution, is that also immunotherapy, one of the biggest drugs in the world, actually originated and was initiated in, uh, at Organon in, uh, in Os. And that's a drug called Keytruda. Keytruda was developed by Dutch scientists um, before Organon was acquired uh, by Merck. They actually started on a program, it's called the anti-PD-1 program, doesn't really matter what this is, but this is one of the biggest drug in, drugs in the world. It has an annual revenue now of about close to 20 billion. And so these are quarter, quarterly numbers. And, so, and people don't know that. That started in, in Oz. Okay, so then we continue the journey, and then we end in Nijmegen at the Radboud University Medical Center. And so half of the team, approximately, of my research group is at the Radboud University Medical Center. Um, and that's, a, in, in some ways, has a very similar history to the Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, but it's some people from, let's say, the west of the country that have been recently recruited. And so she, um, Saskia Middeldorf, she has actually started at the Academic Medical Center of the University of Amsterdam. And so she, she joined Radboud at the same time as I joined Radboud. Um, and this, uh, medical center was also founded around the same time as the Eindhoven University of Technology was founded. Um, started as the St. Radboud Ziekenhuis, now it's now as an English term, Radboud University Medical Center, but you know they're about the same age. Um, yeah, and I want to come back to, to me, I Netea. So the Department of Internal Medicine is a very progressive department. You know, they have made the fundamental discoveries in, uh, in immunology for the past 15 years. And so I think we're very lucky to be working with a person like that. He's a physician, he's a, he's a, he's a scientist, but he's also an entrepreneur. Um, I won't go into detail, but he kind of unraveled like new secrets of our immune system. Um, and um, yeah, we were working together uh, for the, for the past six years now. Okay, so what I envision is that we can have a hotspot, a biotech hotspot that we can be working on for the next five to 10 years along this A50. Okay, then I would like to give some credits to the initiators, obviously. Um, so we had a lot of help, especially from the gate. And the gate is uh, the tech transfer office of the Eindhoven University of Technology that has, currently has a new director. It also started in, in January 2021, um, Jeroen van Woerde. And so he, he helped actually um, with this initiative. Um, it's not that difficult usually with <laughs> working with these universities, but, but here was, was, uh, was uh, very pleasurable. Um, Sonja Vos was also involved in this process. She's the director of TUE participations. And obviously, you know, we needed the involvement of the Radboud University Medical Center. So they're supporting this initiative. You know, they're involved in the program and the Eindhoven University of Technology. And I'd like to end this, um, this lecture with an animation. The voiceover is done by, by one of my former students from Mount Sinai. So you have this nice uh, American accent. 
um, East Coast accent. So I, I hope it works. The human immune system harbors the ability to very precisely combat a variety of threats. It fights off viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites that have invaded our body. It also combats internal threats, like tumors. However, because of our immune system's complexity, not all threats are properly tackled and diseases develop. What if we could empower our immune system to precisely treat these detrimental diseases? For that purpose, biomedical engineers from the Eindhoven University of Technology and doctors from the Radboud University Medical Center joined forces in Biotrip. Biotrip's mission is to establish next generation and science generated therapeutics that empower our immune system to fight off threats in a personalized fashion. For instance, by weakening the immunosuppressive shield surrounding a tumor so that our lymphocytes can attack it. Or, in the case of a transplantation, instead of suppressing the immune system, we will prevent its activation altogether. And, in the battle against COVID-19, precise treatments that manage hyperinflammation will save numerous lives. Biotrip is here to engineer the future of health. What do we do now? Q&A? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think question about uh, your uh, presentation. You, you started telling that you have two types of people, and the bio people and the technical, technical people, and they communicate with this difficult stuff, and they have different language. Could you give an example of how this went in your, uh, your company? How, how did, what kind of trouble you saw, and how was it solved? Yeah, first of all, you realize this, this typical Dutch problem, I think. And so if you look, for example, in, in the Boston region where you have MIT and Harvard and MGH, it all communicates. And there's, there's not these, let's say, these boundaries. Um, yeah, how we started doing that, like, like when I first moved to the U US, I realized, okay, what if you don't create, let's say, very generalist, but you create super specialists in your lab that you let have collaborate. And so you don't have a PhD student that has to do everything, you know, from a mouse experiment to development of the nanotechnology to imaging. But what if we make super specialists that we then like collaborate? And to me, that seems to be more efficient. And, and so that I first started doing that on a very small scale in a small lab eh, because I started off as a young, young uh, uh, assistant professor and then I was growing that concept. And then, yeah, when that, when that's the way of thinking, then it's more of a matter of bringing these people together, just finding if there's also personal synergy. And so if you find that personal synergy, then it doesn't matter that you have very diverse backgrounds and there's something, you have one goal. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I think one of the, 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 the let's say, the, uh, the most important catalyst was a relationship that I had with me, I need to. And I remember the first meeting we had in person, we were finishing each other's sentences and that kind of synergy. Um, and I was used to that in the U.S., but yeah, there was something that we then could, let's say, that culture we could harness also in our company. So, so if you bring two very specialists, and so they have a, their own way of thinking and their own language, and so how they express that often, two typical uh, specialists you are able to, to join together. Because with my experience, it is different. If you have two specialists, it's always very difficult to yeah, get across. And I guess, okay, if that's your goal, you know, you come from to that, and as long as, yeah, as you have to, to go that way. yeah, I know that, okay, that's a problem, but yeah, but you both want, have to want to solve yeah. the same problem, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and then the, the other thing is, like, I'm a, I'm a chemist by training and a biomedical engineer, and let's say a little bit, um, you know, not too diplomatic, um, that sometimes does help, by the way. Um, but I work with a lot of uh, PhD students that had a, a, a background in medicine, and so um, medicine, medical students. Um, and, and I found it very easy to work with them because, first of all, they know how to work really hard. <laughs> that helps. Uh, but they also know how to manage stuff in general. 
And so then I had, let's say, let's say a strange chemist in a group. It doesn't really matter because they have someone who has very good social skills and they can, you can kind of serve as, as glue. And also important, don't grow the team too large. You don't just get the best possible people. You know, don't get too many people because then, then it's probably going to be more difficult to manage. So how many? Well, so, um, so, so now we're about a group of, of let's say, in, uh, academically a group of about 25 people, but that's two teams. And then I have some experienced people, but that's manageable. Uh, but I've seen labs where there's like 100 plus people. Yeah. <coughs> you don't know what's going on. It's, it's going to be very difficult to, to foster a culture, I think. Thank you. Yeah, go. Cool. The biggest challenge are lawyers. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, it was very difficult. Okay, the process looked something like this. Maybe I should walk you through the process. So, at the end of 2016, so I started working with, with, with Mihai in April 2016. Then we, you know, we had concepts working in mice, you know, within a couple of months. It's like, I said, we're onto something. Then you have to convince the business developers as the stack transfer offices. That's the challenge. Right? Because they are paper pushers and box checkers. And, you know, they, they actually don't want you to file for patent because that gives them a lot of work. And so, and so, but that's the first hurdle. So you have to be very persistent. And it's like they try to dissuade you from actually filing uh, IP because they're thinking yeah, it's going to cost a lot of money and most of the IP is not going to be developed into anything anyway. Once you cross that hurdle, um, then you have to go for financing the company. And if you're kind of like, let's say, unusual concepts or very progressive concepts, um, you know, the financing world, especially these venture capital firms, they kind of like parrot each other. That's my experience. Okay, uh, there was checkpoint inhibition was hot and sort of going, going looking after the next checkpoint inhibition. If you come with a very different concept, that may be difficult. But it will, it, it can also work. It can also be, but that was a challenge. Um, so we ultimately started working with, you know, with a very rich individual, a very um, uh, extensive network. Uh, at, at essentially had a family office. Um, also, some some very known people are involved in in financing our company. Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, and it remains a challenge right? because now we're now we have the financing and we're um, we're now on our way to the clinic, but then we have to solve all these problems. So, it's, I think it's a matter of having the personality and working with the people who don't give up. Um, and there was a smart guy, and he said, "I said, yeah, sometimes I think I'm delusional, and we're also proposing these things." He said, "You're delusional until it becomes reality." Um, and I think, uh, you know, you told me that the other day, and it's like, okay, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's a nice way of looking at it. And so you have to be very persistent, um, also stubborn, and, uh, yeah, and ultimately it will happen, but you also have to make sure you work with, with the people who have the uh, same uh, mindset. Um, because it's, it, it's, a, it's a roller coaster, it's another analogy, um, and it's very stressful. And you're solving problems every Every time, and the next one, the next problem, and the next hurdle. So, but that, that's why I actually don't think it's that bad that these tech transfer offices at the beginning of the trajectory are, are so difficult to work with because it's kind of a filter. <laughs> and so you make sure that you filter out you know, people who are not persistent and are not completely convinced about the concepts and ideas. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to know how trained immunity uh, is directed towards like this cancer somewhere in the body, how it starts. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So the question here is, you know, if trained immunity knows there's cancer. Mm -hmm. No, it, it doesn't. Eh? So this is not antigen specific like you have with what, is, what are called leukocytes, eh? your B and your T cells. This is something non-specific. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so... Um, the, the nice thing about it is not permanent. It's epigenetically regulated. You seem to know a little bit what you're talking about. It's okay, so this is epigenetically <coughs> regulated. So it's a heightened, let's say, state of the immune system, um, uh, which is durable, but it's not permanent. Uh, um, it can also, this trained immunity, by the way, 
it can also be a problem. Eh? It's an autoimmune disorder and cardiovascular disease, so it can also be maladaptive. Yeah, so it's kind of like tweaking. Eh? But, but the, the concept, obviously, is not to only use trained immunity. It's using trained immunity in conjunction with, for example, CAR-T or in conjunction with checkpoint inhibition. And that's how you can have this two-pronged approach, and then it becomes specific. Yeah? All right. It's a lot more money. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, you can, you can build an app with like 50,000 uh, investment. Uh, that's not, you, with 50,000, you can do one mouse study. And uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the amount of money needed to get that going some is, or, yeah, there's probably an order of magnitude more. And so for our first company, our seed was 6 million and our series A is 30 million. And, and it's not even, you know, these are not the biggest numbers. I have a colleague who started a company with 18 million uh, euro seed, no, dollar, dollar seed, and 85 million uh, uh, Series A. So th th that's, that's a tremendous challenge, uh, because these investors have to take tremendous risks with these, the, these amounts of money. What, what are the advantages of developing in the U.S.? Sorry, to, to do what? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of, first of all, it's a little, um, let's say the academic world in the U.S. Is, is a little bit more tolerant towards unusual phenotypes, if, if you know what I'm saying. So academic world in the Netherlands, you know, is like you, you have one type of professor, essentially. It's changing, but, that, but I found it very difficult when I was a PhD student, that, that culture at these, at, at, at these Dutch universities, to be honest. Um, was this something I, and then when I moved to the U.S., it was appreciated. That was a little weird. I going from tolerated to hey, I was being tolerated to being appreciated. Um, and so they just look at um, they look at your merits m more than than in Europe. And I would think the Netherlands is actually pretty good if it, if it's if it's about you know judging people people on merit. I mean, uh, there's, there's probably countries where there's a lot more nepotism and much more. And so, yeah, that, that's different in the U.S. And the US, U.S. is also much more risk-taking. And so I saw that I moved to Sinai in 2006, and then we had the uh, financial crisis of, of 2007, 2008. And it's like, oh, Mount Sinai leadership in probably one meeting decided, now we're going to buy, let's say, the entire healthcare system in New York. And so Mount Sinai was a renowned <laughs> hospital, but it was not as big. Now it's the biggest healthcare system in the tri-state area, so Connecticut, New Jersey, New York. And it was because of, of very bold moves by Mount Sinai leadership. They don't do polder. Yeah, they make decisions, um, and I, I like that a lot. Um, and I, I learned a lot from that, because you think, well, you're not supposed to do that. Well, they just do it. So it's, it's a very different attitude. I also, like, I spent 75% uh, of my professional life in the U.S., and, and so that also shaped me, I think. Yeah? Other questions? Okay. Oh, again, thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. <laughs>
Hey, you're still here. So you like the video. If you want, subscribe and click the bell.